It's long been my practice that I received from my father, who was a rabbi, to take my watch off before I speak. And my father once told me the story that a man brought his friend to synagogue who wasn't Jewish, and he said, I'll explain everything to you. They opened the ark. He explained what the ark was. They took out the scriptures. He explained what the Torah was. The rabbi got up to speak and took off his watch, and his friend said, what does that mean? And he said, oh, that doesn't mean anything. So please don't let this encourage you in any way. <laughs> I want to begin with a story about a Jewish grandmother before I get to scriptures. When I was a kid, they used to tell this story about a Jewish grandmother whose, son comes, whose grandson comes back from college and calls and says, you know, Grandma, I haven't seen you in so long. I want to come over. Just like, tell me, how do I get to your apartment? And she says, well, this is what you do. You come to the door, and with your elbow, you hit 301. The door will open. You go inside. With your elbow, you hit the upper button for the elevator. Then you'll walk down the hall to my door, and with your elbow, you'll hit the buzzer, and I'll open the door, and you'll see me. And he says, that's wonderful, but, but why am I hitting all the buttons with my elbows? And she said, you're coming empty-handed? <laughs> so. I realize I am coming here with very full hands, and it's hard to decide if you say, come and speak from your tradition, and you have one chance to speak to people who aren't of your tradition about your tradition, what do you talk about? So instead of taking a single scriptural passage, I'm going to take a theme and illustrate it with three biblical characters, and I hope that that will give it a coherence and a sense that will tell you something that I think both of our traditions share. I'm going to begin with Jacob. Jacob, as you recall, is not starting out the most admirable character in the Bible. He cheats his old blind father, right, by either coercing or stealing the birthright from his brother Esau. And then when his brother says, I'm going to kill you, he runs away. Many years later, he hears that Esau, he's now married, he has kids, he hears Esau is coming with 400 men. And you don't come with 400 men to say hello, <laughs> right? And, a and Jacob then has this very memorable encounter where it's the middle of the night. It says in the Hebrew, Vayevater Yaakov Levado, Jacob was left alone. And a man struggled with him until the coming of the dawn. Now, given that he's alone, generally the interpretation is it was an angel. Some modern interpretations say it was his conscience. Any way you want to go is fine. But this is what interests me about it, is what happens, as you recall, is the angel says, you got to let me go, the dawn is coming, because apparently there's some vampiric element to angels, and they can't, like, I don't know, they can't have breakfast. So he says, you have to let me go. And, and, and Jacob says, then you've got to bless me. And the angel says, what's your name? Now, why does the angel say, what's your name? Because remember, the last time someone said to Jacob, what's your name, he didn't tell the truth. He said, my name is Esau. So first, I want to see if you'll tell me the truth. He says, I'm Jacob. And then he says, your name is now Israel. Now, as a rabbi, for many, many years, I've had a lot of people ask me for blessings. And generally, what people want is blessing for health, for children, for prosperity, for safety, for ease. But if someone had come to me for a blessing and I had said to them, you are no longer Fred, you are now Ernie, <laughs> they would have said, what kind of blessing is that? But that's exactly what the angel does to Jacob. He says, you are no longer Jacob, now you're Israel. But the blessing that he's giving him is the blessing of self-transformation. The blessing that he's giving him is the belief that who you are today does not have to be 
who you are tomorrow. And this proves to be exactly what happens when the next day Jacob goes and meets his brother Esau. And they fall on each other's necks and, and they cry and kiss. And I want to ask you, why doesn't Esau kill him? Why doesn't he? And here, I want to revert again to my father who gave what I think is the most beautiful interpretation of this passage imaginable. He said, remember, in the ancient world, people never did what you have already done 20 times today, which is see themselves. There were no mirrors. And remember, Odysse uh, rather, um, Narcissus, who falls in love with himself, he does it by looking in a pond. Have you ever tried to see yourself in water? You can't really see yourself very well. And Jacob and Esau were twins. They weren't identical twins, but they were twins. Which means that for the first time in decades, they looked into each other's eyes and they saw themselves and they realized how many years, how old they were, and how many years they'd wasted in hatred. And that idea that by transforming yourself, you also give the other the opportunity to transform themselves, that, I would say, is the undercurrent that runs through the Bible. Jacob's son, Joseph, is also not a particularly admirable character at the beginning of his life. He has dreams that his brothers and his parents bow down to him, which already tells you something about his personality. But even more than he goes and tells them, oh, guys, I had this dream that you all bow down to me. Now I have three brothers. <laughs> Believe me, if I said to them, I had a dream that you all bow down to me, they would have something to say about that. They wouldn't sell me to slavery. They're nice, my brothers. but. But the brothers sell him into slavery. I'm going to abbreviate the story. And he ends up in prison. He interprets the dream of the baker and the cup bearer. Then he ends up second only to Pharaoh. And he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. So the rabbis ask the question, Jacob, or Joseph fell by dreams and he rose by dreams. What was the difference? The difference is he fell when he could only hear his own dreams. He rose when he started to listen to the dreams of others. In other words, self-transformation. When Joseph became a different person, his life changed. And he changed the people around him. He changed his brothers, even without their knowing it. And all of this is a sort of prelude for the person I want to spend the most time on, whose transformation is in many ways the most significant because he's the most significant person in my tradition and in the Torah, and that's Moses. So when Moses is born, there's a really fascinating little nuance in the Hebrew about when the Pharaoh's daughter comes to, uh, to rescue him by the Nile. It says in the Hebrew, v'hine na'ar boche, which means, and behold, a child crying. Now, any of you who have ever had children know that you don't first see the kid crying, right? You hear the kid crying. But, according to one rabbinic interpretation, Moses couldn't cry out loud. Because he cries out loud, he's going to be found, he's going to be killed. So he cries silently. And we learn at the very beginning of Moses' life something that he will tell us in a minute, which is he has some kind of trouble with articulation. Moses doesn't, if you've ever had a kid, you've used this phrase, Moses doesn't use his words. You know how when children hit, you say, use your words? Moses doesn't use his words. How do we know this? In all of Moses' upbringing, we hear he, nothing that he has said. He grows up in Pharaoh's palace, not a single sentence, not a single word do we have from him. The first thing he does is he sees an Egyptian hitting a Jew. Now, if you saw an Egyptian hitting a Jew, what's the first thing you would do? You'd say, stop that. Moses doesn't do that. Instead, he kills the Egyptian. 
The Hebrew is Vayach et Hamitzri. And I'll tell you later on why I told you the Hebrew. It's going to recur in a minute. The same thing happens when he sees two, two Jews. He discovers that what he has done is known. He goes off. He hasn't said anything to anyone. And then he rescues um, Tzipora, who is going to be his wife, from these marauding shepherds in Midian. And she goes home and she says, I met this Egyptian. Now, why does she think it's, he's an Egyptian? Obviously, because he hasn't said anything. Because he's just done something and he's dressed like an Egyptian. And then God comes to him at the burning bush and says, go to Pharaoh. And first, he says, I don't want to. He makes all sorts of excuses. And finally, he says, I don't talk right. And the Hebrew here is, I am not a man of divarim. Divarim means words. In Hebrew, by the way, it also means things, which is interesting. We're not going to go there. But it means words. OK? Lo ish divarim anochi. I am not a man of words. I never was, and I'm still not. That's what he says. At which point, God gets kind of upset and says, basically, I'll tell you who has words and who doesn't, and allows Aaron to go with him as a sort of mouthpiece. Moses, though, has always been characterized by action not by words. And he's uncomfortable with words. And even through the plagues, he initiates the plagues by actions, not by speaking. And then finally, you come to Sinai. The Israelites have been liberated. They come to the pinnacle of Jewish history, and God gives what we call the Ten Commandments, but you know what they're called in the Bible? They're called aseret, which means ten, hadivarim, the ten words. Moses, who is not a person of divarim, is given the ten divarim, the ten words. So it's almost as if God is saying, well, maybe you're not a person of words, but I work with words. That's what I do. And Moses takes those words and goes down the mountain, and what does he do with them? He smashes them at the foot of the mountain. Now, if you're Moses, and you, I mean, granted, every right to be upset at the golden calf. I'm not suggesting for a minute he should have been happy. But you're holding the most valuable thing that has ever existed the tablets that God gave you, the average person would put them down, right? And go and yell at the Israelites. If you come home and your kids have misbehaved, you don't take the most valuable thing in the house and smash it and then yell at the kids. Um, <laughs> they've already smashed it, so <laughs> instead, but that's not what Moses does. He takes the most valuable thing that has ever been, and he destroys it. And it is a reinforcement of this idea that I am not a person of words. I don't work with words. And if we didn't get the idea by then, we get the idea when we come to Moses' great sin. Because what is Moses' great sin? Why is he, at least in theory, not allowed to go into the land of Israel? Because in the book of Numbers, when God says to him, speak to the rock and water will flow, he hits the rock. By the way, the Hebrew is vayach et hasela. That's he hits the rock. And those who remember or who paid attention back then when he hit the Egyptian, it's the same word, vayach et hamitzri. Moses is always yaching when he should be talking. <laughs> and it finally, it finally caught up with him. And God said, you are not the right person to lead them into the land because you don't know how to use words. And remember, once Moses is gone, what are they going to have left of him? Words. 
And so Moses finds out that he can't go into the land. And then you come to the fifth book of the Bible. The fifth book of the Bible, which most of you know as Deuteronomy, is not called Deuteronomy in Hebrew. In Hebrew, do you know what the fifth book of the Bible is called? It's called Devarim. And it's entirely the speech of Moses. And Moses, who starts out as not a man of Devarim, becomes literally, and here I'm using the word literally as in literally, the man of Devarim. The book of the Bible that is his is called Devarim. And he learns that words are what will outlast him. And the only thing that they will carry forth of Moses, after all, is his story, and the stories are composed of words. And his self-transformation is to learn the kind of leader he needed to be. But it took him a long time to get there. But he needed to be a leader who could use words in a way that would stir the hearts of the Israelites long after he was gone. And I want to close by telling you a Hasidic story. Because this idea that words are central to the Jewish tradition and to the human experience, but certainly central to the Jewish tradition, you might understand because we wandered. We don't have vast cathedrals. If you go to Europe, there are beautiful churches. There aren't very many beautiful synagogues. And the one thing that we always carried with us, the portable culture, is the culture of words. Right. The reason that you're a people of the book is because books are portable. Buildings aren't portable. Images aren't portable always, but words from parents to children. So here is a beautiful Hasidic story. I think it's a beautiful story um, that actually used to be told about the Baal Shem Tov, and we had some music that originated with the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the movement of Hasidism. So the story goes that when the Baal Shem Tov needed a miracle, he would go to a particular place in the forest, he would light a special candle, he would say a special blessing, and God would work the miracle for him. In time, with his disciple, the candle had been burnt out, and his disciple, who then led the community, would go to the spot in the forest, say the blessing, and get the miracle. Generations passed, and in later generations, the Baal Shem Tov's disciple, who now was five or six generations after him, would sit in his office when the Jewish people were in trouble, and he would look up at the heavens, and he would say, Dear God, the candle has long since burnt out. We don't know the spot in the forest anymore and we've even forgotten the blessing. But I remember the story, and that has to be enough. And God would work the miracle. Again and again, people have transformed themselves not only through what they've done, but through what they've said, through encounters with others, through words that we speak, through words that we hear from God and speak to God. The story of self-transformation is the story, certainly, of the Jewish people, and I think of all people of faith. The promise that tomorrow, you don't have to be the same person that you are today, which, in the end, is a statement of hope and of faith and of trust in God who made us with a spark of the divine, and therefore we are inexhaustible and can always be made new. Thank you. Thank you, David. Rabbi David will be here at the bottom of the stairs to greet you as you go. Being self-transformed through words.
Let us bless the Lord. 